All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, oh, there we go. <laughs> Good afternoon, Representative Miller. We're glad to have you join us. <laughs> All right, well, good afternoon. My name is Heidi Donovan. I'm a professor in the Pitt School of Nursing and one of the directors of the National Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Family Support. I'd like to welcome you to our community town hall on the impacts of COVID-19 on family caregivers. Before we get, whoops, excuse me, before we get started, just a few words about the center. Um, our center is based out of the University of Pittsburgh in the Health Policy Institute and funded by a grant from the Administration for Community Living and the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. It's quite a mouthful. Our mission is to conduct state of the science research and caregiving and to, par to partner with government, academia and the family caregiver community to transform our research into services and programs. Our goal is to improve the care, health, and quality of life with people, of people with disabilities and the families who support them. Uh, first, a little housekeeping. Uh, we'll be recording the webinar today, and in the next few days, we'll send out a link to the recording uh, to anyone who registered. We'll also uh, post it on our website, and I'll show you that, uh, that link at the end of uh, the presentation. Uh, if you have questions for our discussion today, please type them into the chat uh, or the Q&A, excuse me, the Q&A box um, up the top of your screen. Uh, Julie Klinger will be monitoring those and will be bringing your questions into the discussion as we go along or at the end of the planned questions. So now I'm very happy to introduce our distinguished panelists. Um, I'll begin with uh, State Representative Dan Miller. Uh, Representative Miller was elected to the Pennsylvania House of Representatives in 2013. He's the co-chairman of the Subcommittee on Special Education and the Autism and Intellectual Disabilities Caucus. As state representative, Representative Miller has received awards for his advocacy for people with disabilities from Achieva, the Peel Center, and the Rehabilitation and Community Providers Association. Thanks again for being with us today, Representative Miller. Next, we have Everett James, who is currently the interim dean of the, dean of the Graduate School of Public Health at Pitt. He's the director of the Health Policy Institute, the M. Allen Pond Professor of Health Policy and Management, and the Associate Vice Chancellor for Health Policy and Planning for the Schools of the Health Sciences. Before joining Pitt, he served as the 25th Pennsylvania Secretary of Health and oversaw the regulation of all of the hospitals, nursing homes, and managed care plans in the Commonwealth. Thanks for joining us, Everett. Uh, Amber Thompson is our next uh, panelist. She is a family caregiver and chief consultant for Leader of Change, a benefit corporation looking to shift organizations' traditional systems. Their goal is to develop sustainable social and economic business solutions. She consults change management processes with an equity lens to lead transformational change and foster innovation. As a mother of a daughter with epilepsy and an intellectual disability, she's been an activist within the public school system, fighting systemic inequities and working to ensure that children with disabilities receive the services they need always, but especially during this pandemic. And last but not least, uh, we have Michelle Sippel. She's a family caregiver and the vice president of the Achieva Family Trust. Michelle spent 16 years at Family Links in Allegheny County as the Service Coordination Unit Director. In this role, Michelle directed several departments, including the Supports Coordination Division, serving over 3,000 individuals throughout Pennsylvania. Michelle has spent her career in the social service field and has extensive experience working with individuals diagnosed with intellectual disabilities and mental health, as well as the aging population. And thank you, Amber and Michelle, for joining us today. We're really happy to have you. Before I begin our discussion, I'd like to set the context by sharing some of the findings from our recent community survey on the impacts of the pandemic. The study was spearheaded by Scott Beach, one of the co-directors in our center and the director of the University Center of Social and Urban Research here at Pitt. 
The study was a cross-sectional community survey conducted between April 15th and May 27th. We received responses from 619 family caregivers and almost 3,000 non-caregivers. The survey assessed impacts of COVID-19 on employment, financial well-being, social interactions, health behaviors, and physical and mental health. I'll focus on the next few minutes on primarily caregivers here. So a majority of the family caregivers were female, 45 years or older, a majority were white and reported a bachelor's degree or higher. Almost half of the caregivers were providing care to a parent, but we also heard from many spouses and uh, parents of children with disabilities. Over half of the caregivers were living in the same home with the person they were caring for. The top three reasons caregivers were providing care were for long-term physical conditions, memory problems, and emotional or mental health problems. We were able to compare the impacts of the pandemic on caregivers compared to non-caregivers and found that in many, many cases, caregivers were reporting more significant emotional, physical, and financial effects than non-caregivers. They reported more worries about family members getting sick, and they worried that family members would be denied care because of their disability. They were also more likely than non-caregivers to report that their emotional well-being, their mental health, and their physical health was a little or a lot worse over the past few weeks. And they also reported, uh, they also scored significantly worse on measures of depression and anxiety than non-caregivers. Financially, compared to non-caregivers, more caregivers reported food insecurity, worrying about having enough money to buy food, worrying about running out of food, and many reported having had run out of food without money to buy more. In addition, while caregiving is hard in the best of times, caregivers reported that COVID-19 had changed their caregiving duties and responsibilities. Providing care became more difficult emotionally, physically, and financially. They reported less access to care, both inside the home and outside of the home, and reported that the lifestyle changes and social isolation they were experiencing led to emotional problems and family disagreements around care. Finally, while we found uh, that caregiving uh, was hard for all caregivers, uh, some caregivers were certainly at higher risk than others. In summary, female caregivers, younger caregivers, caregivers of color, and those with less education or lower income were at higher risk for negative impacts from the pandemic. In addition, those caring for someone with emotional or behavioral issues and those caring for children or young adults were at higher risk. And finally, those caregivers who resided in the same home with the person receiving care were at higher risk. So with that as a context, let me begin our discussion. So uh, my hope is that I will we'll just throw out some questions to you all and um, you can jump in when you're uh, inspired to uh, jump in and uh, I may ask some specific questions of individuals as well. But first of all, maybe we could just start out with each of you saying a little bit about yourself and then talking a bit about how the pan pandemic has affected your life, your family, and or your work. Amber, you're showing up first on the screen for me. Would you like to share some with us? Um, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us. I am a mother. Um, I'm also a caregiver for my own mother. Um, so my daughter um, is part of Students with Exceptionalities in Pittsburgh Public. Um, so in regards to COVID, her education has been imp impacted. They haven't implemented her IEP since March. She even had ESY, which is extended school year of the summer for three weeks, still didn't have her IEP implemented during, during that time. So I haven't spoke about her IEP moving forward in the fall. Um, so it has impacted her education. As you can see, she's home. So um, it's impacting my work. Um, Audrey doesn't really, doesn't really care that I'm on me. <laughs> this is a good way of saying it. Um, so a lot of my um, clients and a lot of partners um, 
are very well aware of her and speak to her during my meetings. Um, in regards to my mother, my mother has lupus, um, so she's also immunocompromised, and she moved in with us in December. She had an accident, so she's still recovering from that. Um, and because of her, her lupus, um, we have all been quarantined pretty strictly um, in my family. And because of Audrey's epilepsy and her threshold, she can, um, that would trigger seizures as well. So um, COVID has impacted um, education. It has impacted how we um, get our necessities. It has impacted um, how we communicate with our family. Um, my, my siblings and my relatives are support systems for us. Um, we have had less support. So um, it's impacted us pretty um, severely. I'm thankful that we can put food on the table, but there are so many mutual aid programs that we've also leaned in on to, to help us in this time. So that's, that's what's going on with me. Thank you. Well, uh, you are a one of the sandwich generation of caring for, uh, for parents and for children. So that's it. Well, thank you again for being here during this busy time. Michelle, you're next on my Brady Bunch screen. Would you uh, want to share anything with us? Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, I would just echo a lot of what Amber said, but I'm here with my son, Kobe. And um, Kobe's going to be a senior this year. Um, so uh, last year when COVID um, hit everyone back in March, um, he was supposed to be finishing his junior year. And, um, you know, it was supposed to be two weeks is, is what we thought. And so, you know, we kind of, we, you know, hunkered down and we thought, you know, these two weeks, we'll just get through it. Um, and then when two weeks turned into three weeks and four weeks and just got extended, it, it did get very difficult. Um, so Kobe, um, he also is a student with exceptionalities. He does have an IEP. Um, he does have cognitive deficits, but he is also immunocompromised. Um, so, but one of the things, and I'm sure, and he can tell you, um, is that school is a place that he enjoys going, uh, much more than academics, I would think, is social. Mm hmm Yeah, I like seeing my friends at school, and it's upsetting that we're stuck in the house for a while. And, like, I want to go back to school because I want to see my friends and graduate at I felt sorry for these seniors this year that graduated. They were stuck online, so I felt sorry for them, and I don't want to do that this year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, you know, so, you know, him not being able to go to school and have that social peer interaction became very difficult. He's also a very structured guy. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, he was, he, his routine. Teen, it, being lost was very difficult for him. Um, he's a very time oriented um, individual. So, you know, being that everything was unstructured was very, very difficult. And, you know, there weren't things to do. This is, this is a, a guy who likes to stay after school most days and go to basketball games and participate in activities and do his best buddies and you know, he just wasn't able to do those things. And it became, you know, I would say after the third or fourth week, it was hard to explain, hard to understand, and very, very stressful for myself, him, um, obviously my husband, and then I have two other younger children. And so um, it was, it was a very difficult time for all is it Kobe or Kobe? still is Kobe with a with a B. Okay, thank you for being with us, Kobe. Do you want to? Do you have anything else you want to add? Yeah, I have a job also at Harvest Valley Farms Market on Route Eight. Um, I help all the people there. Like when we get new people, I also help them learn new stuff about us and like teach them what to do. Um, like one day we got a new person in our store, so. They're working in the back with me, so I had to teach them. 
-hmm. like the new stuff about it and like let them know what to do. And when you couldn't go to work, he was devastated mm -hmm. um, because we obviously we had to make a tough decision but that because of his, you know, immunodeficiency, he could not go to work and be exposed. Um, and this is what brings him pride and this is what brings him joy. And so um, it was it was a very difficult, you know, couple of months and again, still is so. Well, I'm sure they missed you too as well, Kobe. Yeah, they did. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. And we'll look forward to hearing more from you. Um, Everett, you're next on my screen. Would you like to talk a little bit about how, uh, how this has impacted your, your life and your work? Well, I, you know, first I want to thank uh, Amber, Michelle, Kobe, and Dan for uh, joining us today. Um, you know, I think it's impacted everyone clearly. Uh, it's uh, been more disruptive uh, to people that are caregivers and providing care for uh, people with disabilities and, uh, and elderly parents or loved ones. Um, you know, for me, uh, it has brought a lot of things into focus. I mean, I really now, uh, you know, obviously now that I'm dean of a school and uh, we, we have a lot of new faces, uh, people that are coming to study with us this fall. So, you know, we've really had to completely adjust the way that we're teaching and delivering education to people uh, and doing our best to do that as much online as possible. But some things really do require in-person, uh, kind of along the lines of what Kobe was saying. Um, you know, and then obviously the research mission, you know, that's a real driver for the university. And, you know, there is some research that can be done uh, as you are learning with, uh, with the center. Some of it can be done uh, electronically and we're doing data analysis and things like that. But, you know, whether it be data collection or if you're doing basic scientific research where you have to be present uh, to study things, uh, it really has been uh, difficult to keep those uh, trains running. So uh, my, my, my life has really changed in terms of bringing the focus of trying to make sure we're delivering a good educational product, uh, making sure we're delivering, you know, continuing to deliver the research, uh, you know, that the federal government is assigned to us. Um, you know, and I think from a personal standpoint, um, I'm just a lot more aware, acutely more aware of how disproportionate some of these things uh, that come along like a pandemic. I was actually uh, the head secretary of health when H1N1 hit, uh, but this is a, another level of disruption and uncertainty and, uh, and it's impacting different groups differently. I mean, there's a lot of disparities related to this. There's a lot of disproportionate impact on low income uh, and you know, different groups. So I, I've really become more acutely aware of that and I'm focusing my efforts now and thinking about how we take care of vulnerable people uh, in our community. So I look forward to talking about that today. Good, good. I hope we'll hear a lot more about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and Representative Miller, your last one. We'd love to hear about how this is, this pandemic has affected you and your life and your work. So um, good to see you all. Uh, hi, Heather. Um, so, uh, you know, look at um, COVID-19 um, doesn't often create new problems. It, it, it exasperates what was already a problem. Uh, so that um, is the challenge that, that we face. Um, you know, here in the 30th anniversary of the ADA, um, an important year uh, with, a, with an important bill, we knew that the work was not done in relation to its goals and missions. And this was supposed to be a lot about sort of what we need to do next. By the same token, COVID is threatening to push a lot of us back. Uh, and uh, there's no doubt that there are uh, sizable challenges. The, you know, caregiver issues were there before, they're worse now. Uh, access to employment or transportation were there before, they're worse now. Um, schooling, um, 
while having a, a lot of progress, at least since when I was in school, um, you know, uh, still has uh, its issues. Um, in a lot of ways, too many kids with special education needs. Um, to be honest, the spring was, uh, was a, an utter disaster. Um, and, and that uh, continued in, uh, I think Amber might have mentioned, I think maybe something about ESY. Um, and here we are on the cusp of the fall, wondering what is different about uh, from the experience in relation to the spring, what lessons have been learned, and what can we expect uh, going forward. So there, um, uh, my office has been inundated uh, with the basics of life, um, which yes, has included a lot of concerns about unemployment, um, you know, uh, has brought about issues of food insecurity and so forth. Um, but also brings about issues more specifically tied to the, uh, I'll say a broadly speaking disability community, um, who unfortunately to some ways, almost I think to some regard, um, feel that uh, they don't have a lot of places to turn uh, for, for assistance. Um, as I'll say, maybe some of the typical um, uh, people are, 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 are in challenge and in need and taking up a degree of bandwidth. Um, you know, it's uh, a lot of people have been ra raising hands and waiting for their turn to, 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 to get some assistance. Uh, and now it's like all of a sudden you turn around the line is you thought you were at the, you know, the door, but you're more like a mile from a mile from it around the corner. Um, and uh, to try and get that opportunity continues to be uh, a deeper, more painful struggle for too many. So, um, you know, uh, we have been trying to sort of uh, raise that issue both um, uh, locally and uh, in Harrisburg. Um, like I said, we knew this should be an important year. Uh, unfortunately, it seems much more challenging than we had anticipated even back in early March. Um, uh, but it, it is, again, it is showing what the flaws of our system had always maintained. It was just, uh, we thought it was impacting or a smaller amount of people than it actually is. And instead that chasm threatens to swallow up a lot of us. Um, and so we need to get, we don't need anybody in that chasm, we need everybody out. So that's, that's going to be the tough one. But that's what we've been spending a lot of time in my office trying to talk about and focus on. Thank you very much. Um, you've all talked about some of the challenges. Uh, what about, what do you think has been most surprising or unexpected for you? I'll open that up to any of you on the panel. I'll, I'll answer that. Um, something that I think is most surprising to me and putting on what um, State Rep um, Dan, Dan is saying is that like people think the benchmark started when COVID happened. So many folks, the research is starting at like in the middle of March. And no, for us to truly identify how this exacerbated what was happening, we need to understand how it was happening before March. That's not the benchmark. That should not be where we begin our research. Um, that to me is the most, the most surprising piece. So you're saying we, we shouldn't be trying to get back to that place. We need to start with understanding how, how difficult things already were for you as a caregiver. Is that, is that did I? Say yes, that? yeah, definitely. Cause I mean, just thinking about the issues that we were having with the IP, trying to get my mother um, health insurance, um, trying to get her some kind of um, support for her physical therapy. All of these systems were completely flawed before March. And we were already struggling to get to March. So when March happened and everyone's like, oh, everyone's affected by this. This is so bad. All of our systems are broken. I was like, They've been broken. You just weren't impacted by it. But now that you are impacted by it, can we go back to when you weren't impacted by it so we don't repeat this again? Yeah, uh, you know, I think I think Amber is um, is spot on. You you don't need me. You got Amber talking on this. So, uh, you know, look, it's um, I'm not even sure, to be honest, that certain systems were were some were broken. Uh, some were doing doing what they were you know designed to do, which just wasn't enough anyhow. Um, so, 
you know, not to get into a, a political catchphrase that I, I see somewhere, but uh, look, it's uh, a lot of people talk about, well, what can we do to get back to this or get back to that? You know, to a fair degree, you know, especially in the disability community, there's no interest in that. There's no interest. I'm not trying to get back to what it was like on, on March 3rd or February 29th. Um, that's crumbs at the table. Um, that's still not where the majority of us were ever trying to go into these issues. Um, March and February, as far as I know, that wasn't the, the, the top of the mountaintop, right? So, uh, so I think that that, you know, I think that's very well put. I think Amber is spot on with it. Um, uh, it, it for some people that may have been the mountaintop, God bless, uh, in the disability community here in Pennsylvania, um, that definitely was not the case. Thank you. I'm going to interrupt for one minute. We have a raised hand from John Butterfield. So I'm going to allow him to speak now. Are you there, John? You should be able to unmute yourself now if you had a question to ask. Or maybe it was an accident and that happened. So, John, if you do have a question, uh, you can just raise your hand again or type it anywhere in the chat. Great. Thanks, Heather, very much. Does anyone else want to add to the, to the most surprising or unexpected or, or an unexpected aspect of this? You know, well, go ahead. I was just gonna say to add to that, I think one of the things that we experience personally and in my professional life, which um, again, I work for Achieva, um, is, is the level of social isolation that I think was brought to the forefront uh, for especially um, the individuals that, that I work with are, are, you know, diagnosed with a disability and the social isolation um, issue was huge. And I think I knew that it existed, but again, the surprise for me was just during the pandemic, just how it, it just was exacerbated. And, and again, personally with Kobe, how isolated he became because, you know, he, he doesn't have really peers that, you know, call him and talk to him. His, his relationships are all at school. So the social isolation that he was feeling and then the individuals that we work with, you know, in my, in my professional life, how, um, you know, they were calling and how lonely they were and isolated they were. And, you know, they don't have a lot of family, you know, relationships. And, and so that really, um, that was, that was a surprise. Again, it's something that, you know, um, maybe even unconsciously, but it was really brought to the forefront. Thank you. Yeah, you know, the, um, you know, look, the, again, the isolation aspect, um, uh, for a lot of kids who are struggling the most with it, um, they weren't getting the calls or the texts beforehand. They weren't getting it, right? And so there's a, a bill that I wrote, for example, um, that uh, what we had found out this a couple of years ago, um, I was in there uh, for, in a classroom where a child with autism was uh, presenting to his fifth grade class who'd been with him for a bunch of years. And he was talking uh, about what it was like and how autism impacted him and how best they could um, communicate with, with him. Uh, the, the questions after his presentation, which I thought he did a great job on, but the questions afterwards were like, do you play Xbox? Uh, do you like uh, you know, uh, baseball? And what got me about it was how they didn't know him. Yeah. How much that this young man was in their class for at least five years for most of them. And they did not know him and how foreign the concept was for these kids who have been with them, for them to be like, I didn't think he played Xbox or a video game or something else or new Minecraft or whatever else. And it made me feel like with that, I'm like, wow, we've done a much better job uh, from when I was in school when, uh, when kids um, you know, weren't at their home school and weren't with their neighborhood peers. 
Um, the question for a lot of them was uh, now, uh, well, at least in uh, pre-COVID, was they were physically there, but were they actually there? Yeah. Uh, and for, I think, for what COVID did, is it really reflected, I think, where a lot of people are is uh, you weren't there. They weren't there because the isolation sunk in within the first nine days or so. And you realize that they're not getting the phone calls and they're not getting the tweets and they're not doing the TikTok or something else. Uh, and then it just highlights how separate the experience was, even though they were physically in the same space. Thank you. So uh, before we get into, I know a lot of the viewers on the call are um, interested in some of the maybe policies coming down the pike or maybe some action or services or programs that we might be able to talk about or recommend. Um, but maybe we ought to, I think it's, uh, I think other things that people are interested in is, you know, some of these specific systems or programs um, or policy weaknesses that this pandemic has exposed. Um, anyone willing to speak to that? And I know we've talked about personal experiences that reflect failures, but um, I think it's worth talking about a little bit where we were. I could take a shot shot at some of that. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with uh, my panelists any any more. I mean, really, what we've done is brought these some of the problems and many of the problems with our existing system into focus. Uh, and hopefully, it's uh, there's enough focus on it across the political spectrum where we'll start to see some. Uh, you know, some real activity around addressing these ma massive gaps uh, that we've got that, again, disproportionately affect uh, some individuals much more than others. But, you know, I think when I look at where we are today, I mean, I think one of the things we've learned is, you know, hospitals and all the money that we spend on hospitals and nursing homes, I mean, that's just not anywhere near enough. And, you know, there's going to have to be, if, if, if there are a, you know, if there's a, a more finite resource pool or there's less money available, we're gonna need reallocation of resources away from institutional settings and institutional care into, you know, community-based care and into to individuals that are supporting people in, uh, in the community. I think that's, that's just crystal clear. Um, the other thing that, you know, when I think about public policy, I think about resources are so concentrated around certain things. Obviously, that's an example is where, you know, all, most of our healthcare resources are going to support institutionals care. Now, you know, the hospitals really have demonstrated that not only A, are they mostly full when there's something like this isn't happening, so there's really nowhere to go, they will become overrun if a big problem exists, but the other is that most people would prefer to receive care in where they live and where they work. And we have to bring that, uh, you know, to them. Uh, and, you know, I think those are the kind of big picture policy areas, you know, the three areas that I've tried to focus on in my research and our work is, you know, really looking at what are the health impacts what are the employment impacts? Is there significant employment impacts with, with a lot of these issues? A lot of people have to leave the workforce to do what it is they're doing to care for people. And then there's a lot of financial impacts that we ought to be trying to address. You know, a lot of our resources go to a very small proportion of the population. And lately, in the last few years, a lot of the federal resources have been going to corporations uh, and so, you know, there's going to have to be a reallocation of resources to look at the financial impact of these problems. So I can go into more in depth on that. Uh, but let me just kind of throw that out as a construct for my uh, colleagues. I know Dan thinks about this a lot. and He's been, you know, a champion on these issues for a long time and, and really has you know, made a lot of headway. But, you know, it takes both parties to address the problems when we're talking about changing policy even at the local level, state level, or federal level. So those are just some uh, initial thoughts maybe to get our conversation going, uh, Heidi. Thank you very much. Amber, I think you've got something here. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I totally agree with Everett. 
And I would add to that, none of that matters if we don't do with an equity lens. If we're not actually looking at the intersections in informing in our research and decisions based on who's marginalized, we need to understand marginalization to begin with. Um, we also need to understand the difference between equality and equity to really move that needle. So when we're re looking at our budgets to reallocate funds, and we're looking at it through a race or gender or equity lens, we need to focus on what are the budgets that are already creating disparities, already perpetuating um, inequities, already oppressing large groups of people, and reallocate those funds back to our hospital spaces. But before we take those, those funds into um, advocating for um, better care, we need to, uh, we need to audit those, those systems and understand how they're doing those things too before we give them money. Um, every, to me personally, before we make a next move, everything needs to be audited. Our policies and procedures and internally in our organizations, our policies and procedures and practice in our government and our policies and procedures and community development. Um, the, the, the levels at which we need to address inequities um, isn't something we can do incrementally, and it isn't something we can do um, it quickly either, right? Um, and why, why I kind of agree with Everett and also say pause is because I don't think employment-wise, the people that should be doing this work are in the positions to be making these decisions. Um, so there's just so much nuance that, that is happening. Um, and to, to add to those areas to um, accessibility. You know, we're on a dis disability panel and everyone looks at COVID like it was just about economics or like it's just about health, but it's actually about accessibility. Who, in, who had access to these resources to, to not, be, um, not be a part of the population that's been oppressed or um, a disparity? Um, who had access to not be a frontline worker? Who had access to the healthcare that they needed? Um, who had access to the the foods to keep our health at a you know at a certain um, point to not be impacted? So um, th those are just my takes on it too. And I, I think you know while we said that you know some of the pieces in our our research. Uh, survey were not unexpected. I think uh, the inequities really did did show up there in that survey. So, was, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, you know, um, you know, look, it's uh, I represent two um, two school districts that are very different, right? So, uh, uh, one is Mount Lebanon, um, which is uh, pretty well funded, very blessed in a lot of ways, good sized school district. Um, and then uh, I also represent uh, part of the city of Pittsburgh, which has it, it's some of its challenges that are pretty well documented. Um, a lot of hardworking people, but um, still some challenges in the district. And, um, you know, let's still remember that whether it, your child um, uh, was in special education or not, if your child went to Pittsburgh public in the spring, your child got almost five weeks less education than the kid in Mount Lebanon, okay? So five weeks less, almost. So uh, inequity is, 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 again, nothing new. We know this, and, and again, the COVID effect is it magnifies and exasperates it. Um, and we're still in a situation, um, I, I'm still hearing that there are challenges today in Pittsburgh in relation to uh, technology. And whether it's assistive technology, again, that, that, that often is a necessity for uh, a lot of our students uh, with, with uh, different types of um, special education needs, or whether it's just te technology. Uh, we are still, we, we need to redefine what, what, what is appropriate. Uh, and across the board in education, for example, knowing how much remote learning has to be uh, a functional reality for us to constitutionally meet our requirement those in the legislature. We can no longer accept that any child in Pennsylvania is ready for school if they do not have at home 
a computer and the ability to access functional internet. Uh, if you don't have that, then in my opinion, the state has not met its constitutional required obligation. And then the inequity has grown too great. And let's, in some of this is we've always had a degree. Some would say the inequity, yeah, well, I'll leave some comments to that, but there, uh, we've always had a degree of inequity. But uh, sometimes that degree goes like this. Uh, we were bad with our ed equitable school funding before COVID. We were near the top of the nation for inequities in school funding. That's how it was before COVID. And now we sit here where I represent kids who had five weeks, almost less education. Um, and that's not even talking about the quality. I mean, we're all getting caught up with access, which is key in, uh, to the internet and uh, so forth. There's quality components too that we, that's the second aspect that we're really not getting into yet. How do you learn? How effective is that education? If you have ADHD, uh, you know, if you have uh, autism, uh, if, if you're a typical teen, maybe a typical teen, 14 year old boy, like I was with, you put me in front of a, a computer screen. I keep, I'm looking all around here, just talking to you, let alone for five hours trying to be online. Uh, how effective is that model of education? Uh, what are we doing? But again, those questions are, are even are heightened based on uh, when you're in dealing with a special education model. So it, uh, again, it's, um, these things are massive. I saw somebody, I think, texted, uh, sent us something, you know, like uh, in relation to the legislature. Uh, and look, keep in mind, this is my opinion. The legislature is not helping. The legislature is not helping. If you're waiting for the legislative cavalry, we're going to be waiting a long time at this current pace, at this current direction. It, it's not coming right now. Don't get for the first four and a half months of this crisis, the House Education Committee met once, yeah. once in the first four and a half uh, months of this crisis. Does that sound like something's coming? Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, we've had a little more action in recent times, the last couple of weeks. But by this point, the creativity that some of the scenarios uh, demands, the nuances that need to be addressed, we're up against a wall, a hard wall, because the legislature, in my opinion, did not make good use of its time to be sure that uh, parent like uh, uh, Michelle uh, and, and, and uh, Kobe, right, uh, had brought up about being sure about what they missed and what made their schooling so special and what they needed to happen. How close can we get to certain aspects of that? How can we prove, improve on Kobe's experience, right? How can we do that? So Kobe is back with his friends and having that connection that I know he, he misses and that he wants. Um, and how can we make them even more real, more common and more fulfilling? Um, that's where the legislature should have been. Uh, we spent uh, three and a half months debating whether or not you should wear a mask or whether it was patriotic to say, I won't help. Right. So my patriotic duty is to not wear a mask. That's what the first three plus months of the legislature were doing. We're coming back in a week to set up a bunch of things, uh, you know, next week that are going to be their veto bills or political games uh, that that both that these sides will play. Uh, and uh, they're not solving your problems. Right? That's not what the legislature is doing. That's not what we've been doing. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pause and, and kick the mic over. But Look, I, I'm I'm 14 year firefighter in, in my town here, right? When we have an emergency, we 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 get together. I don't care who you voted for in 2016, 2018. I want Kobe to have that great education. I want Pittsburgh to be online when they should be online, right? And I want uh, a, a child who who's growing up concerned about what real opportunities that they will have because of their concern about how their disability will impact their other opportunities. I want them to really believe that the sky is the limit, right? So I want that to happen. But we are struggling too much with it because in the legislature's inability to lead, inability to agree on facts, makes it much more unlikely that we will agree on solutions. And what's left in the middle of that is the same population that's always left in the middle, though always left out in this regard, the population that struggles to say, don't forget us, why do you always forget us and, and, and that demands something different? But I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's great. And the caregivers are prominent in that group. Everett, you had your hand, I think, on the mic, and then I'd love to hear from Michelle and Kobe. Yeah. 
Well, I think listening to Dan, I can, uh, you can now understand better while I'm, why I'm not uh, the health secretary in Harrisburg anymore. And I'm happily uh, in the University of Pittsburgh uh, doing research because uh, it is hard to see uh, the uh, kind of lack of responsiveness and the politiza politicization of every, all of these issues. Uh, but, you know, we need to support uh, people like Dan who are continuing to fight, they're continuing to introduce bills. Uh, there is a lot that can still be done, I think, to, to increase not only funding for these programs, but the structure of these programs, the eligibility, the utilization, how can we make these things more consumer directed? So every individual that's a caregiver for somebody with a disability has very unique needs. And those individuals should be making the decisions about how to apply the resources. So this idea of consumer directed services within the suite of programs, those are the kind of things I think we can continue to drive. So, uh, you know, it is frustrating to see the lack of consensus around the politics around some of these issues. But, you know, I think now more than ever, uh, we've got to take this opportunity when these issues have been brought into focus uh, to drive these problems to the top of the agenda, uh, to support that with good research uh, and continue to fight for change. Uh, and there is, you know, something happening in early November that will give us uh, at least an opportunity to, to make sure our voice uh, is heard as well, even if we are going to do it through mail and not uh, in person. All right. So Michelle, actually, I'm going to throw out a question from um, Sharon Spurlock, who's one of our, the people watching right now. And um, this may sort of resonate personally, but also professionally in your work at Achieva. So Sharon wanted to know about legislative initiatives and creative strategies um, to support families who are trying to implement IEPs with children who can't learn independently um, and don't necessarily connect to Zoom. Families are losing jobs, facing behavioral challenges from their children, uh, and they have high levels of stress and depression. Basically, in-home supports have stopped. Yes, well, um, Achieva, definitely our advocacy is, is second to none. Um, you know, so one of the um, pieces of legislation right now that's kind of stalled out is the HEROES Act. Um, which is um, at the federal level. Um, and one of the, the uh, pieces within that HEROES Act is in regards to family medical leave uh, for caregivers, which I think is a, is a really important subject. So um, we, don't, we don't really know if there's anything, maybe Representative Miller can speak to, to anything at the state level. Um, I don't know that I've heard anything at the state level as far as legislation goes. Um, but in regards to IEPs and and, you know what's going on with education. Um, we do have educational advocates at our agency who are always willing um, to to work with families and in individual situations. So please just give us a call at Achieva, and uh, we'll be happy to work through those situations with you. You, you know, and and we're always there to support families and and yes, absolutely. And just back to Amber's situation and what Dan was mentioning about, you know, this Republic not having, uh, you know, those five weeks of being offline. I can tell you that even with Kobe and his IEP, you know, we were in a very similar situation. He couldn't get online for weeks. And, you know, his special ed teacher um, and his uh, caseworker would, you know, we would have a, a meeting every Friday and they would say, are you guys doing okay? And we'd go, no. And they would laugh. And, you know, I mean, and they were, they weren't being unkind about it. They would, you know, we'd be like, I'd be like, no, we're not, we're not, you know, but they would, they wouldn't know what to say. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it was, <laughs> I, and I don't know that it's going to get any better right now. Um, but uh, so, yeah, so, so definitely um, supports around that IEP issue. I would like to add to that because I'm totally um, on board with uh, state rep Dan. Like, I, a lot of my work is nonpartisan, so it doesn't matter who's in office. I'm I'm working around policy and someone, um, I'm working alongside some other um, former super, superintendents 
and they're sharing with me how other schools, while everyone's remote, the kids the, with the most vulnerable needs, such as those children, are still coming into the class, into the schools, where it's a handful of children. Um, like, my daughter does not need to be, uh, she learns best by being around other children, yes, but she um, is you know, very technologically savvy. She loves being up under me and sitting at home and doing schoolwork. Um, so her needs are different, but a majority of children are like her. The children that need to be in school and need that socialization, need that that learning because of you know the their disabilities. That is not like thousands of children. You know you're able to make these accommodations outside of policy if you are trying to be innovative, right? Also, there are um, Brown, the Brown Mamas group in Pittsburgh here is doing education pods. So they're doing three days a week, two hours. Um, the after school providers are opening up their spaces. Um, everyone's being very intentional. So now we need to look at like, what is Pittsburgh Public doing to reallocate these funds since they're saving millions of dollars, how can we support these folks who are um, who are providing that gap education piece that they are not doing? They're not doing as they're uh, what they're state mandated to do. You know, um, so I think if we we come to a point where we don't rely on policy and we get to a point where we rely on our procedures and practices, we can we can answer these questions. And there, there are people who are doing it outside of policy. Now, these are great examples of creative solutions that come from within. And um, I, think, I think some demands on the, the I, I like the way you call it, just to the procedures and practices of our school systems or our individual schools, right, that can uh, step up. A bit. You, let, me, uh, let me make a couple comments about family medical leave. And uh, you know, Dan may have some thoughts on this as well. Um, you know, I think most people have some understanding of the Federal Family Medical Leave Act, uh, otherwise known as FMLA. Um, but, you know, basically what it does is provides 12 weeks of, uh, of pay for, you know, certain individuals that meet the requirements, but it really only applies to larger private sector organizations. So you have to have 50 or more employees and then it does apply to most public sector organizations. So when you look at the use of it, it really is those working in government and public sector or working in very large corporations. And the big gap in that really is where most people are employed is in smaller enterprises with fewer employees in that. So um, States do have the authority to uh, expand uh, family medical leave at the state level. Uh, I think just to date, I believe only 11 states have done that. Uh, but it'd be interesting to hear a little bit more maybe from uh, Dan, if that's, uh, you know, a possibility, if that's in the mix uh, down in, uh, in Harrisburg. But one thing I do want to say is, there is a lot, of, a lot of the programs that are supporting individual disabilities and caregivers of those individuals, there's a lot of investment in the stimulus in related programs. So I would urge anyone on listening into the call to, you know, think I think we lost Everett there for a minute. Well, let me. Um, Thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah. So um, before we get into the, the paid leave real quick, I, I would note, by the way, I think in your bio, you might have mentioned something. Uh, I'm actually the, um, uh, the minority chair of the subcommittee on special education, right? Um, uh, that subcommittee hasn't met in seven, I think it met once in seven years. Okay. So just. <laughs> Okay, so remember, this is what I'm telling you, okay, in relation to what work is being prioritized when the majority decides what, when, or whatever they want to bring up. So it's been seven years, uh, I, maybe once in seven years that thing met. Uh, I do have a, uh, um, I am a uh, uh, co-prime uh, sponsor on a, on a paid leave bill, Family uh, Care Act. Um, 
is modeled off of, uh, I'm going to say at least a half dozen other states that would seek to, uh, uh, to, to fill the gap that I think Everett was trying to get to. I'm sure his best, oh, yes, yes. about to say his best part, I'm sure when he froze up. So, um, so look, it's, it's the reality, the problem with FMLA is not only, again, uh, that it doesn't cover so many people, right? So he was correct on the numbers, but it, it's not paid. It's not paid, right? So uh, look, it was a successful step forward, much like the ADA, a successful step forward uh, back, uh, you know, under Bill Clinton's presidency, right? Uh, and a bipartisan bill uh, when it was passed. However, now that it's it's been 20, five years roughly since that was done. But we, we really must, again, redefine it and recognize what it needs to be for how our economy works and what our families need. And they need paid leave. Um, they need paid leave. So my bill is one of several. There has, there, there's been, I think almost every year that I've been there, there's been uh, some new version of some type of paid leave. It has largely been the sort of the, 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 the priorities of, of one caucus over another. Uh, however, the bill I referenced, the Family Care Act, uh, thankfully, is bipartisan and it's bicameral, meaning there's a Senate companion bill as well, likewise supported uh, by Republicans and Democrats. The bill's teed up. Now, it needs to be passed, but it would also take a little bit of time for that, uh, for the funding of it to kind of get to where it needs to be. But when we're not investing in the systems that will support our uh, people, um, then things happen, like our unemployment system. So if you don't invest, and then when the emergency comes, you're much less likely to be prepared and ready to help. Do you want to talk just a little bit about the Family Care Act for people who are not familiar with it? I mean, look, it, it's, um, you know, um, uh, it came through a variety of groups that have kind of been a partnership with it. The one I worked the most with was the Women's and Girls Foundation uh, here in Pittsburgh, right? And um, uh, it, it, is, uh, it includes almost all workers, meaning there is a little bit of a threshold you have to do for part-time work, but it will allow for a good chunk of part-timers to also have access to it. Uh, so um, it is based off of, unlike some models, it is based off of uh, an employee's salary. You're talking a fraction of a penny per hour will be pooled together. Everybody's in, nobody's out. So you know, if, you, if you make you know, $5 million, or you make seven twenty-five an hour, as ridiculous as that still sounds. Uh, you're paying in. Everybody pays in, and then that 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 pot is available uh, for people to to use. So uh, again, it's uh, I'm thinking California, I'm thinking Rhode Island. There's a variety of states that have already done it that have it up and running, um, uh, and it has worked to help people in the type of crisis that we're in. Uh, it is sitting in both committees, both uh, labor committees, if I recall. Um, I believe the Senate did a little more looking at it which I give them credit for. Uh, the House um, continues to act like the House and um, it's, it's not been a priority. So we struggle. I'm seeing a little more uh, things coming out of the Senate. Uh, so I would suggest if you're interested in the Family Care Act, you may want to focus a little bit on the Senate uh, Labor Committee. Uh, thank them for discussing it and for uh, urging them to bring it up for a vote so that we can get, to, get it moving. Great, thank you very much. Julie, do you want to introduce some questions from the, from the Q&A? I'm back. Oh, thank you. Great. <laughs> Maybe it's time. Actually, Julie, I just invited you in, but I've, we've been sitting on one that um, you know, we've been talking a lot about education, and we have a couple posts from people really concerned about uh, their older relatives uh, who are in long-term care facilities um, and wondering, you know, sort of what the status is, um, you know, what, what changes are coming down the line? Are there, are, are there changes for visitation? Are there, you know, initiatives around recognizing the, the danger of isolation and the risk that comes with that for those people in long-term care facilities? Do you mind? Yeah, sure. I'll take, I'll give you my two cents and uh, others might know uh, more currently than I do. But uh, one of the promising things we're starting to see uh, around the country and here in Pennsylvania is this idea of not just trying to, you know, isolate everybody from visiting loved ones in the nursing home setting, but we're trying to figure out who are 
essential caregivers. I think most of us would argue that every caregiver is essential at some level. Um, but what that would do then would allow us to figure out a way to make sure that those individuals receive the proper infection control training, that they get the personal uh, protective equipment is, is given to them um, so that they can safely uh, visit. And then I think once we move toward designating individuals and giving them the supports they need, then those individuals are being allowed to go uh, in and, 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 and increase the visitation. So we're starting to see some increase in allowing individuals that have the right training and equipment to go in and uh, into the nursing homes. I mean, the nursing homes have been a very difficult, uh, and again, it's another exposure of the problems with caring for people in that setting. You know, I, I, a friend of mine, uh, father passed away in a nursing home over the last couple of months. And, uh, you know, the family was un unable to be with him, including his wife, because he was in, the, uh, he was in the, the part of the nursing home that visitation wasn't allowed. And she's living in an in, in independent apartment on the same thing. So this really, again, has exposed, or going to my words of my colleagues, exacerbated some of the problems and really brought them into focus. So, you know, we do need to figure out a way to make sure loved ones can get into and visit with, uh, because, you know, isolation can be as damaging as, as many more physical conditions, uh, as we've talked about earlier. So those are, that's just one idea that's starting to take hold is that we're figuring out who should go into the nursing homes and allowing visitation again. And again, is this going to come at a sort of a state policy level, or do you think it will? Yeah, the are regulated at the state level, so uh, it it will it will have to be a program to make it work in cooperation with the nursing homes, uh, so that the procedures are actually followed, and that we do not see. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, Another significant outbreak in the nursing homes. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we have another good question here. Um, uh, do the panelists think that COVID and its impact will result in changes to paid family leave, paid family leave, which, uh, Dan, you started to talk about a little bit, and universal child care policies? Um, these, these two issues undercut several of the inequities experienced disproportionately by individuals from a minority background, women and people with low wage jobs. It would be great if we can use this as an opportunity to demonstrate the effects of not having these in place across the board. That's from Teresa Thomas. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I've also, uh, not to go back into, uh, th there's a lot there with the nursing homes. Yeah, there there's is. A, there's uh, so much, again, that, that should be discussed, should be looked at uh, by the legislature. Um, um, part of it should also be on how better to support those uh, employees. Um, you know, and that's been a big issue is, is availability of testing. Um, as we have learned more uh, and develop better policies, how they can be supported and instituted uh, um, uh, across the board. Don't forget a lot of those people, even when we, I'll come back to childcare, but even when we talk, uh, uh, well, a lot of people doing a lot of life sustaining work are paid horribly. They're paid horribly. They're supported poorly. Um, their, uh, their rates are too low. Um, it, it, um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's not respective of all about the work that we need them to do. Um, and that impacts those who are working in nursing homes, those who are working, uh, you know, in more of a, uh, you know, uh, a group home as well, you know, a group home scenario too. So we should be valuing those people much more than we do. You know, uh, you know, essential gets thrown around a lot. When your loved one is in that nursing home, when your loved one is in that group home, uh, you tell me what essential means. Uh, and in relation to uh, visits, Look, it's uh, my grandmother who, who was paramount in raising me, suffered from Alzheimer's. You give her three months of not seeing us yes. at a stage where yes. she was at, 
that would have been the last time we would have ever had any connection. So there's no doubt a lot of pain, a lot of struggle in adapting to it. And there's things that the legislature should be looking at. But if it, but you know, anyhow, we'll see. Uh, look, childcare, again, massive, right? But if you and I were all, if we were all together in January, February, and March, when we have been saying that childcare is easy to access, quality, uh, and, and supports working parents, would we be saying that then? And I, I, know, I know Everett said it too about exasperating. It just, yeah, look, it, it, it's just, again, it's another example of what's not being done, what hasn't been, uh, been done uh, to provide working people or family caregivers, uh, parents who are working with the supports they need to be successful. And, um, you know, we think about what the state doesn't build out. Well, the state doesn't build out uh, enough of a quality accessible health care. The state doesn't build out a community-based mental health system that is easy to access. The state doesn't build out a strong network uh, that would be able to, uh, uh, to provide the types of in-person in, uh, in home care that we'd like to see, right? So it's all fine and dandy uh, to say, yes, I'm for that, yes, I'm for that. And I say this with all due respect to a lot of my, to some of my colleagues. You know, well, look, we don't need the pictures. If, if, if your loved one is in the, these struggling categories, we don't need a picture to appear on, on your newsletter. We don't need a picture to be on uh, your email blast. We need you to vote to make real changes that can yeah. support families. We need that now. Don't do the pictures. Do the votes. You're the only ones who can do the votes. Yeah, agreed. I'm a, let, me, let me take a couple of shots. That's very well said, uh, Representative. Um, I guess let me just talk a little bit about paid family leave because I brought it up earlier. and I do think that that is a policy solution to a lot of these issues, not all of them, clearly. Um, so, you know, I think it's important. We always have to know what's been done and what's being done now. And I think, you know, the, the people tuning in today, you know, should know that in the stimulus bill, there was at the, by the federal government and a temporary expansion of paid leave. So employers can now take tax credits to providing family leave up to 14 weeks. Now, whether the employees are going to take advantage of, employers are gonna take advantage of that is another issue that people should take up with their employer. But that is a temporary measure that's in the relief bill that is uh, the federal government has put into He's having to, we'll see if he pops back on here. Leaves us hanging. Amber, do you want to step in? I know you've had something you wanted to talk about while we try to get Everett back on. Yeah, because um, I think Everett was like going to segue into what I was going to say. A couple of years ago, um, and I, so I come from the diversity and inclusion space as well. And um, I was working at a law firm in a position working with um, partners and non-partner lawyers and inclu including into staff, which if, if you work with a law firm, you understand the, the complexities of this, but working on caregiving and changing the language and not saying child care or family medical leave, but saying, caregiving and these, this caregiving time, um, when you use that language, you can expand it outside of just the traditional um, parent with a child um, that, or a child that falls under FMLA or having a child to get child care, you know, um, like caring for my mom, I would not qualify um, for some of these, um, some of these uh, services. So we, had work, we were working on internally as an organization. So that's where, it's, where we as people who are having these frustrations need to lean into our employers, we need to vote not only with our vote, our ballot, but we need to vote with our dollars. We cannot continue to um, not be done. <laughs> these are things that I find, um, I found important um, it, 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 that my employer needs to provide. So looking at it as like changing the language to caregivers and also expanding this um, to more folks that would use it, but outside of just our state and our federal level, but we can change that internally in our policies and in our corporations and our organizations and nonprofits. 
um, we can we can address that at a at a very hyper local focus too. And I, I want to encourage people to speak up and write reviews and vote with your dollars and write to your state reps and your elected officials um, and, and advocate for yourselves. And if you can't do it, then reach out to the advocacy groups that are doing it. So that's all I want. You want to point them in uh, specific directions for that if they want some help in thinking about how to become advocates? Um, so definitely I've worked with Achieva um, around special education, also Department of Human Services. Also with these, there are so many mutual aid funds in the county, not just in the city, in the county. Um, and I know several mutual aid funds go out to Westmoreland and um, to like Greene County too. So um, look up mutual aid fund. There are the local organizations around me are um, like Lawrenceville United. Um, we have uh, the resource navigators through um, DHS or just resource navigators through each of um, certain nonprofits. Take Action on Valley has resource navigators. Um, there are so many resources that uh, folks aren't aware of, and it's not their fault. Um, but in regards to speaking up as an employee, uh, you can reach out to organizations that help folks unionize, like Pittsburgh United. Um, so I guess that's something maybe you could reach out to me if you have specific questions, and I'll put my information um, in the chat. But there, there are ways that we as individuals can be empowered to make these changes um, without waiting for the policy. And these, while we're doing this, this data collects and goes back into policy as well. Um, so that's where my strengths are, is let's do it. Let's find a way to, to meet in the middle without having to go to our elected officials. Well, also. <laughs> Yeah. Let me, let me, I don't know if I'm, I, I guess I'm speaking, like you get about half of what I'm trying to say. And then uh, obviously either I'm technology challenged or, uh, or I'm somewhere where it's not coming through very clearly, but that is a, you know, that's a really important point, right? I mean, it isn't just about our elected officials, uh, you know, and them being able to address these problems because look, changing state law, and changing program structure is a time consuming activity. It's more time consuming than it should be, which Dan pointed out. Uh, but you know, there is policy at the private level too, right? I mean, what a corporation does to support its employees is a policy within that corporation. And I, I wanna point to a couple things that I think are pretty pretty interesting in that area. And you might be able to use these as a resource because it's always the most effective way to work with your employer is to show them what other employers, you know, are doing. Um, so there's an initiative in the United Way here in Pittsburgh that has brought together employers to advance paid leave and family medical leave at the private sector level, again, in that gap where the federal labor law doesn't apply. And so um, they have an initiative. Uh, I wanna say, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say the rights, one of the big consulting firms that really took the lead and established a, 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 a I think, you know, they would probably say a generous leave policy. I would say an intelligent leave policy that actually recognizes the needs uh, of the employees. but. You know, I do think that that's, you know, Amber is right. I mean, it really, it, it isn't about, we still have to advocate for change in policy at the county, state, and federal level. We need to elect individuals that are going to go and get things done. Uh, but we also need to be working with organizations in our own community and our own employers because private policy can be changed a lot more rapidly uh, than public policy and leave is a perfect example of something corporations have the power to do, but honestly, most have been dragging their feet, uh, but maybe COVID will have an impact to say, okay, we really lead, we really realize now that having, get, supporting our employees when they are need to care for 
a person with a disability or care for a loved one, an elderly loved one, that that's good business. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that, I think, Amber, you, you raise a really good point. It's not just about advocating to policymakers. So um, another uh, question, which I think is important, which will, uh, so will you, this is from Rhoda uh, Dorfthaum, will you address seniors caring for seniors? I'm 76 years old, caring for my disabled husband at home. I find since COVID, I am more socially isolated. Any supports for us? It's a really tough one. My, I mean, it, it's tough. It's tough, but it, you know there are resources. And one of the things we found out when I was working in the in the Pennsylvania Department of Health, and and uh, since I've come to Pitt and kind of looking at the gaps in some of these, so you know there's this whole issue of program availability, and then there's program utilization, and organizations like Achieva, offices like. Dan's office do a great job of making people aware of these programs and services. But, you know, I would definitely take a look at what the triple A's can offer an elderly person who's caring for an elderly person. That is, there's, there's hundreds of thousands of you here just in our county that are uh, in that position. And, you know, we've gotten an increased investment in the family caregiver support program during the stimulus and during COVID, uh, we've got an increase in, I mean, one of the issues we haven't talked about is this idea of respite care. So people like Michelle and Amber can speak to, they need a break sometimes, right? They need somebody to come in and give them a break so they can get healthy, so they can, you know, focus on their own needs. And so there is a lifespan respite care program that is available to individuals as well. I'm not saying these are adequate. I'm not saying they're adequately funded, but I would, I would definitely point you to making sure that you're taking full advantage of the resources that are available to you that have received some additional resources of funding as a result of COVID. And there is some money, additional money in there for these programs in the federal relief around COVID. So uh, I would think it's important to uh, to really, you know, make sure you're using, you're getting the full benefit of the programs that you're eligible for as a starting point. Yeah, and I have put area agencies on aging in the Q&A section. Um, I, uh, oh, maybe I didn't, maybe I put it in chat. Um, I will put it over there with their website and you know, I've put in for the Allegheny County, but feel free to type in if you're needing a connection to a different county and we can help you do that. Um, you know, if, if I can, you know, let me say uh, two things with it. Uh, one, I very much appreciate Everett's uh, words. Um, I will say though that in my time in the legislature, I have seen a bill become a law in like 10 days, right? So um, when the legislature wants to do something, it can move in lightning quick. You blink and you can miss it, all right? Uh, by the same token, part of what we talk about, there is an educational gap here. Um, so for even someone like myself who has some degree of expertise, like we know in the disability community with it, you know one person with a disability, that's all you know, right? Uh, and while there are some similarities and challenges, uh, there still is a great diversity in the community, broadly speaking. The majority of, of, of members, in their hearts, they want to be helpful. But in reality, they don't know what it is that you're talking about. Uh, and while they could picture something, they could say something with it, um, overall, they don't know. And I don't know something, so I don't want to act like I'm some fantastic expert. But uh, so there is a gap that comes up. Until your loved one, family member, something like this has gone through some aspect of what we're talking about, they don't know. They get lost in your acronyms. They don't know what the, the meanings of certain things are. They don't know the names of your technology. Uh, they don't know what it means to come up to a bus that isn't uh, wide enough to be able to fit your particular type of wheelchair, right? So uh, on their lift. So, uh, so, so there is that gap. And to some degree, it's understandable. 
to some degree, it's understandable. Uh, the, that's a bit on all of us as a larger community to try and find ways to, to educate, to take that moment, take that step back, uh, and if necessary, spoon feed as to what it means. This is what it means when I'm at home, when we say we're at home and there's a caregiver at home. To me, it's like a public-private partnership, all right? The state has their responsibility uh, to your loved one in this regard. You are private. You are a private person who is doing the best that you can to love and care for your loved one. And, and you're trying to do that at home. And uh, too much of the American experience sometimes is almost kind of like, you know, uh, sh sh stay at home, be quiet, keep to yourself, don't ask too much. That's what you should be doing. That's your responsibility for it. Uh, that only doubles down on the isolation, the frustration, and the stress that accompanies that. Um, uh, and and it, it's not fair, it's not right, and it's not what people need to be able to keep doing it. So if we want to provide for some of our, uh, our, our, our citizens to which a higher degree of independence is not always the path, then you have to be supporting the stay-at-home uh, caregivers, whether they be for a child or whether it be for a spouse, whether it be for a, you know, a 19-year-old or whether it's for a 98-year-old, right? What's the priority? How do you build that out? How do you make it easy to access so that a person who goes to apply for help doesn't get lost in the bureaucracy of trying to do that? And that you have to somehow be able to get some sort of like specialized degree or pay some uh, amount to be able to access it because pay is and, and, and that level of accessibility continues to be a problem uh, like was said earlier um, so for some people with means access is never really the issue okay for some people who really have the need uh, the, 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 the the problem finances is always the roadblock um, I would also like to add, uh, depending on who, wherever this person lives, again, back to the mutual aid, that I know across the county there are buddy systems where there are people who are in communities volunteering to support their neighbors. So we're do so the mutual aid where it's like intentionally to build relationships in a time of um, social distancing or physical distancing, there are people who are signing up to just call in and check on folks, run errands, um, come and sit with them in a safe distance. There are folks who are stepping up to support people um, in these time of needs. And again, I put my information in the chat to just say uh, across the county, um, I know that a lot of neighbors are, are stepping in to support people. So um, I just want to stress the mutual aid efforts that Pittsburgh, that's, I will go toe to toe with you about all of the disparities and equities this city um, has, but I will say the response to community organizations and nonprofits um, have been very um, community focused and in, in pulling in neighbors to actually um, to support in those gaps. So we need to lean in on our mutual aid efforts the city has, has built because they are very significant enough that they get re nationally recognized, but also there are, there are barriers to people finding them too. So please, if you are feeling isolated or if you are feeling alone or not supported, again, reach out to me and I will help direct you in a, in a organization that can support you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Very generous. Um, so I'm going to, just a couple things. I've got one more question from um, our Q&A that I want to throw out. Um, before that, I want to do two things, and Heather's going to probably kill me later, but Heather, um, I would like, if, you know, if we can, we've gathered a lot of resources on our own website, um, uh, caregiving.pit.edu, but I think relative to some of these questions, and if our panelists you know, if you have time and if you wouldn't mind sending us a couple of your favorite resources. Um, and uh, Amber, you've mentioned a few, we probably know some of them, but I think we'd like to put together just a quick summary. We're not a direct service provider um, at our center, but we are really trying to find ways to connect people to that information in a way that it's a little bit easier to get. So we'll compile something that we'll send out with uh, the link to this recording, if that's possible. Um, before I ask the last question, I really want to give Michelle and Kobe a chance to sort of throw in some of their last words, um, because I think that our last question may 
end up being uh, directed towards um, Dan and maybe Everett a little bit too. No, we just wanted to, to to thank you all for the research that you've done and for bringing this to the forefront during this pandemic and, you know, for just, you know, bringing the caregiving issue um, again to, to everybody's attention and, and speaking for a group of people that really don't get a lot of attention. And so just wanted to, to thank everybody and thank you for inviting us uh, on the panel and we just really appreciated it. Toby, you have any words of wisdom for us or anything else? Just thank you for all that you guys done for us and let us come on and speak to everybody. Well, we appreciate you, you spending your time with us. It's really, uh, it's made it a much, much better experience for all of us to have you here, Kobe. So thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, this last question from Paula is that, um, and it circles back around to this voting issue and being a knowledgeable voter. So for people for whom caregiving is such a, an important issue, um, she says she appreciates the emphasis on voting and making sure that caregivers' voices are heard, um, but at times it's difficult to make sure that the choices we're making in terms of candidates um, or parties uh, that we're voting for caregiving policies. Um, and so is there a way to make this more clear to help guide voting decisions at the local, uh, state, and national level? So, um, so you know, uh, unlike a lot of areas, uh, it is tough if you want to uh, log on to see my uh, environmental record. You could go do that. I, I think it was 96%, right? So, but whatever. So you get to go see what I what I do there. If you want to go see a labor record, if you're interested in a business type of um, uh, background or, or voting record, you could go do that. It's it's not that difficult. I'm sure in almost every state you could find those types of, um, I'll say for lack of a better term, special interest scorecards, okay? The challenge uh, for so much of the disability community is that everybody's hanging on by the skin of their teeth, all right? So uh, whether it be time or funding, they have, uh, we have struggled to develop uh, infrastructures that, that, that pull some of that together. I do think I have seen some um, things from uh, the ARC uh, uh, that have kind of given you sort of a breakdown on some of the key bills. But I do think even that requires a little more homework for, for you to do. So uh, I'm unaware of, of, of a disability scorecard. I'd like to know what I would get. Um, so if you know one. Uh, but I would say that the best thing really is, and it's tough, I try to find ways, um, ways to make it simpler, okay? But when um, you gotta talk to your individual members, uh, and it, and uh, uh, so that when you have an IEP meeting, you need to work in that on the day of your IEP meeting, you email your state rep and your senator, for example. Okay, you tell them what you need, tell them what's going on in your in your in your uh, child's life or your life, uh, and you let them know so they hear directly, and you ask them something. Don't just more ask them, ask them something. Okay, uh, if you're going in for a case management uh, type of thing, if you're going to uh, a, a nursing home to review a safety plan or something like this. Just like uh, on certain times of year where you're supposed to like a turn, uh, change your uh, fire uh, your fire alarms uh, batteries, email your state reps and your senators and, and ask them something. Did you know I go do this? What is your policy on that? And I need, you know, will you vote for more X, right? One email a year or two can really make a big difference when it's coming from everybody. And I know it's tough because again, life is challenging. We're all dealing with so many things that are, uh, for lack of a better term, we'll say, uh, dealing with uh, atypicality in a typical dominated world, right? <laughs> so uh, how can you do that? And, and to add one other thing to all of us sounds like a lot, and I know it is, uh, and I know it can be, but it's the only way really at this time for you Plus it magnifies your voice. Don't do it to a state rep or state senator. Uh, that's not yours unless you really just kind of, you know, have some time. Get to know yours, talk to yours, email yours, call yours. You got to work those things in once or twice a year and you'll make a difference. You'll end up knowing more where that person is if you do that. Um, but again, I don't know about a scorecard otherwise. Yeah, 
Thanks. I'd also like to add um, to a, something that I noticed, and I'm part of like um, my local elections, so I campaign and door knock and all this funny thing. What I've noticed about, um, so my state rep um, was Adam Ravenstahl. I also live alongside Sarah and Amarato. The conversations that they have are very like segmented and compartmentalized, where it's where it might be they might be talking about. Um, area on aging in education and I have to parse out the disability pieces of that so if they're not speaking on education or they're not speaking on um, social security or they're not speaking on Medicaid or Medicare anything of these those things then I already know that they're not thinking about disability or they're not thinking about caregiving so you have you have to start with like what are my values what I care about and then parse out the conversations that they're having. Um, something I was excited about Heather reaching out is that I would love to see this department at Pitt grow. Um, some, I worked with the Lend Clinic and they're kind of like a holistic um, department where they have every part of the physical, mental, and social health um, teams, right? Um, something like that is not gonna happen in politics because like, Dan Miller is Dan Miller, one person who's going to have a narrow focus on one or two things and enough to know about everything else. Whereas like our issues expand across the spectrum um, on it, our issues are impacted across the whole spectrum that Dan Miller, one person in his office cannot be able to, to, um, to really get there in the, in the time of his life is how I feel about it. So we, as people who, who need to focus, come to it and say, what are our concerns? What are our kids sick? What are our cares? What are they talking about? And do I see myself in what they're saying? And very often, no one is talking about education. So I already know what the deal is from the gate. Um, Emily Kincaid came to me straight, IEPs, um, Civil Rights Act, if those are things that we need as people um, who are caregivers or people with disabilities, those are things that we need. And if our representatives aren't talking about that, that's, that right there is your, your stop, you know? Um, but it's, you really have to parse out what they're saying and, and educate them, but also parse out if they're not saying it. Amber, thank you so much. I mean, I think you've really given a call to action for all of us. Right, that it's uh, we we depend on people like uh, Dan Miller and uh, other legislators, but um, it, we as individuals and collective groups uh, coming together to to give voice to priorities is uh, uh, really really important. And I, I think you've inspired all of us. Everybody here on this panel has really. Um, it's been an amazing experience for me to listen to this um, collective wealth of information and energy and commitment to this cause. Um, so I'm, I'm really sorry to say that our times come to an end. I, I wish we could go on more. I am going to share one thing in case, you know, anybody else has one last thing that they, um, oops, sorry, I'm not doing the right thing. I just have to get our shameless, um, publicity here, not really publicity, but we really do hope that um, our center can become a source of, you know, connection for people doing the hard work in research, in policy, and living um, the experience of caregiving for people with disabilities. Um, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, check our website. Heather Tomko, who's here, is our just fabulous uh, outreach coordinator. Julie Klinger is our center uh, manager and uh, these two women really can help you um, make connections moving forward. Check out our website for future events. Um, and thank you for sharing an hour and a half of your very busy time with us. We really appreciate it. Take care.